Okay, well, good afternoon and welcome uh, to today's lecture sponsored by the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. I'm Marie Griffith, I'm director of the center, and this is our final public event of this academic year. It's the last week of classes around here. I hear that the wild uh, student event is this weekend, so watch out on campus. So it's an exciting time of year. Um, if you don't have information about the center, there's information out in the entryway, and I invite you to take uh, anything that you like there. And as always, we welcome your feedback, your suggestions about our events and our programming. As I hope you know by now, the center is a, an ideologically diverse venue for fostering rigorous scholarship and engaging with uh, broad academic and public communities about the intersections of religion and U.S. politics, both historically and in the present. And we always invite your assistance as we take up these vital challenges. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Sam Hazelby, who currently serves as Assistant Professor of History at the American University of Cairo. Prior to that appointment, Professor Hazelby taught at the American University of Beirut and served as a junior fellow in the prestigious Harvard Society of Fellows from 2007 to 2010. He has also taught history and religious studies at Eugene Lang College at the New School in New York and has been a visiting lecturer in the Bard Prison Initiative at Bard College. Professor Hazelby received his BA in Comparative Literature and History from McAllister College and his MPhil and PhD in History from Columbia University. He has received numerous fellowships and awards and has published articles in a range of prominent venues, both public as well as scholarly. He has two book projects in the works. The first is a manuscript under contract with Oxford University Press that is titled The Origins of American Religious Nationalism, which offers an explanation for how the first modern republic founded on a legal separation of church and state became the most religious political democracy in the Western world. The second project in progress is titled The Impact of the Opium Trade and China Missions in Anglo-American Protestantism. His talk for us today is titled Losing America, Trying for the World, The Origins of Global Protestantism. Please join me now in welcoming Professor Sam Hazelby. I might just hold this. Thank you all for coming. Thank you especially to uh, Professor Schmidt and Griffith for uh, looking to the other side of the world for somebody to come and speak on the history of American politics and religion. Um, I'm very happy to be here at the Danforth Center and in St. Louis. Uh, I've tried to present this talk in, in an accessible way uh, and not to uh, uh, be too specialized, uh, but I want to encourage anybody who has uh, a question to please just raise your hand and, and feel free to uh, feel free to ask me. Um, <clears throat> and on that note, I think we'll just we'll go we'll go right into it. I have a few images here for you, uh, but it's really just a few. Um, <clears throat> in his 1830 State of the Union address, President Andrew Jackson spoke on the conflict between the state of Georgia and the Cherokee Indians. Siding with the state of Georgia and excluding the Southeastern Indians from membership in the American political community, Jackson explained that, quote, wandering savages and settled Christians could not share a political community. Jackson's address marked the first time that a US president turned to a theological justification for an active empire. In the address, Jackson at length paid tribute to the American missionary movement, which had long led a campaign to enfranchise and Christianize Native Americans, especially in the Southeast. Jackson, Andrew Jackson and the American missionary movement had a complex relationship. 
No one than the missionary movement had done more to fuse American nationalism and American Christianity. And even in repudiating one of the main uh, components, one of the main missions of the American missionary movement, Jackson availed himself of this accomplishment of theirs in bringing together American patriotism and American Christianity. I'm going to explain part of the background of that story today. Uh, basically to tell you from where the American missionary movement came uh, and who they were in, in their own society, which was the Amer America of the Revolutionary Era and the United States of the Early Republic. Let's start with a pair of images to help uh, get a somewhat longer perspective on Protestants and, and missionary work. Okay, this, <clears throat> some of you will be familiar with uh, the seal of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, it was produced in 1630, uh, and over here on this side is the cover of the Missionary Review of the World, uh, another uh, missionary, American missionary publication from May of 1920. Uh, what they have in common is uh, they both quote uh, Saint, uh, the Macedonian speaking to St. Paul from, I think it's from Acts in the scriptures, uh, saying, come over and help us. Um, these were both produced by Anglo-Protestants, uh, one in 1630, this one in 1920, so almost 300 years apart. <clears throat> Uh, to evangelical Christians, these words of, Saint, of, of the Macedonians represent a core obligation of, of, of Christianity. Uh, for the historian, however, they present something of a puzzle. And they present a puzzle because the seal of the Massachusetts Bay Colony is a fundamental misrepresentation. Martin Luther and John Calvin and early modern European Protestants uh, throughout the 16th, 17th, and 18th century talk a lot about converting the people of the world uh, and the attendant glorious transformation that that would involve. But the fact is that for a long time, it's all talk. Early modern Protestants were remarkably bad missionaries, so bad, in fact, that it's itself an interesting problem. Between 1517 uh, and 1800, for almost three centuries, Protestants basically do nothing as missionaries. Now, among Protestants, the least likely missionaries were probably the Puritans. The Puritans who settled in New England left England because they believed the church of uh, the Anglican church lay beyond redemption or reform. Once they arrived and, and established the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, they devoted themselves to scrutinizing who among them was not really pure. Rhode Island and Connecticut were founded because the Puritans of the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, could not bear one another's errors. Uh, for a people who moved all the way across the Atlantic, uh, they observed a remarkable inwardness, even uh, in their physical landscape. Uh, a 1635 law, for example, <clears throat> forbid the construction of any house further than half a mile uh, from the church meeting house. And for all the Puritan talk of conquest, and they do talk a lot about conquest if one reads the uh, ample Puritan writings, uh, they remained, the fact is, for almost two centuries in their coastal towns uh, facing east toward the sea and Britain. Uh, they even filled their towns with what one historian has described as hedges, walls, and fences, all of them frontiers of exclusion. Puritans were too concerned with fine, the finest grained assessments of human goodness to undertake the comparatively coarse uh, good work of missions. They were, in a sense, uh, the Trotskyites of early modern European Protestantism. That is to say, they were essentially excluders, not missionaries. If you want to find missionaries in the early modern Americas, uh, one looks not to Anglo-American Protestants, but to the Catholics of New Spain. As early as 1559, 802 Spanish Franciscan, uh, Dominican, and Augustinian missionaries had established over 150 religious houses in New Spain. 
By the early 18th century, the Jesuit, one, uh, the Jesuit run Reduccionis of Peru and Paraguay were home to uh, perhaps as many as 150,000 Guarani Indians. This is just basically at the end of the first generation of uh, Catholic missions in New Spain. In contrast, in a century and a half, the Puritans admitted 74 Native Americans to their congregational churches. So why do Puritans, why do Protestants take nearly 300 years to start doing missionary work? The primary reason, I think, is that they simply lack the resources uh, for systematic missionary work until the beginning of the 19th century. There is a partial exception to this, the, the British Society for the Propagation of the Gospel. Uh, but generally, this is true. Uh, there's another reason, too, uh, <clears throat> and I think that is the advent of modern nationalism uh, in the late 18th and early 19th century. Now, characteristically, when Protestants do finally turn to missionary work, they embrace it with a, with a characteristic vital energy and purpose. Between 1607 and 1787, that's 180 years, American Protestants founded exactly zero missionary organizations. Between 1787 and 1827, in just a space of 50 years, New England Protestants alone found 933 Protestant missionary societies. So why did the New Englanders start doing this? Why not, for example, the Virginians or the Carolinians or the New Yorkers? <clears throat> the main reason, I think, is a contest uh, ending in defeat for control of the United States, a defeat that was not just political but also cultural. And let's look at the matter in a continental perspective here. It's a little bit difficult to see this map, but it's also one of uh, the reason I chose this map of North America from 1795 is it's very good at uh, the on the ambiguity of the boundaries of the United States. Um, the boundary between Canada and New England is very uh, unclear. It looks as if uh, large parts of the Caribbean and, and Cuba might be part of the United States, which many Americans hoped they would become. Um, but uh, what, what becomes the Louisiana Purchase, including where we are now, uh, was at this time still primarily French and Spanish. Um, and although in some ways Anglo-America at the turn of the 19th century, at least compared to Spanish America, uh, is still uh, a relatively uh, small uh, place, it's obviously still at the same time very large and diverse. It's filled not just with British settlers, <clears throat> such a thing as a Brit barely existed in the late 18th century, but with East countrymen, West countrymen, Welsh, as well as French, Spaniards, Belgians, Dutch, Germans, Portuguese, West Indians, uh, many distinct Native American societies, uh, a diverse lot of Africans and others. Uh, now many of these people throughout Anglo-America, whether you're it could be in the Mosquito Coast of Nicaragua, or the fisheries of Newfoundland, uh, or Phil, uh, Quaker Philadelphia, <clears throat> essentially uh, lived in uh, different societies. Um, in this Anglo-American empire, there were basically three cores of support for the rebellion against Great Britain. First, you have the tobacco lords of the Chesapeake, uh, second was this artisans and small farmers of New York and Pennsylvania. And third was the New Englanders. And in New England, it was really southern and eastern New England, uh, a corridor essentially running from Boston to Princeton uh, that offered the most ferocious and uncompromising resistance to British imperial rule. The first cause for American independence that I have been able to find anywhere uh, came in the summer of 1769, the first open calls for American independence uh, at the Yale College commencement in New Haven, Connecticut. Two of the leading sons of New England, Timothy Dwight and John Trumbull, disrupted the Yale College commencement with a nationalist demonstration. 
John Trumbull's valedictory speaker's address, an essay on the use and advantage of the fine arts, is actually a call for nationalist revolution and an American-led world empire. Trumbull and Dwight were part of a literary movement that called themselves the Connecticut Wits. I'll read you a piece of, of Trumbull's commencement address. See where her heroes mark their glorious way. Armed for the fight and blazing on the day, blood stains their steps over the conquering plain, mid, thousands, mid fighting thousands, mid thousands slain. Their eager swords promiscuous carnage blend, and ghastly deaths their raging course attend. Her mighty power the subject world shall see, for laureled conquest awaits her high decree. Now, Trumbull called this gruesome poem an essay on the use and advantage of the fine arts. And there's actually an interesting relationship between those two things, the violence and what it has to do with the fine arts, and we can talk about that later if, if, if anyone is interested. More importantly, for, for our purposes, Dwight and Trumbull <clears throat> were part of a literary movement called the Connecticut Wits. Uh, and the Wits were not only America's first native literary movement, they were also America's first nationalist movement. In the 1760s, nobody was an American nationalist except this group of writers. American national glory was their consuming theme. A few of their titles will, will, will give you the idea. David Humphreys wrote Address to the Armies of the United States of America in 1780 and a poem on the happiness of America in 1785. Humphreys also wrote The Industry of the United States of America in 1802 and The Future Glory of the United States of America in 1782. David Humphreys' Future Glory of the United States of America should not be confused with Trumbull's Prospect of the Future Glory of the United States of America, written in 1770. Uh, Trumbull also wrote The Genius of America, an ode, in 1777, and so on and so forth. Now, today, the best known member of this group is Noah Webster. Uh, Noah Webster's American Dictionary was a product of this literary movement. Um, in his, his uh, 1828 was when, Noah, uh, when Webster published the first full edition of his dictionary. Uh, he had actually been a secondary member of this group, um, but uh, I'll give you a, a couple of, of entries from, <clears throat> from the dictionary just so you can see how it, it, it fit into, uh, their, 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 um, uh, into their movement. Um, in the entry for reason, for example, Webster offered the following illustrative sentence. God brings good out of evil, and therefore, it were but reason that we should trust God to govern this world. To illustrate the verb form of love, which Webster defined as a sense to be pleased with, he wrote, quote, the Christian loves his Bible. If our hearts are right, we love God above all things. Hundreds, perhaps thousands, uh, of Webster's definitions, either through the definitions themselves or through the quotes he cho chose to illustrate them, uh, celebrate quiet Christian obedience and deference to authority. Um, as I mentioned, though, Webster was considered a secondary member of the group. Um, <clears throat> they generally considered uh, lexicography inferior to poetry. John Trumbull, Joe, Joel Barlow, and Timothy Dwight, who I have pictures of here for you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Joel Barlow, John Trumbull, and Timothy Dwight were the most productive members of the group. Um, and of these three, uh, everybody agreed that Timothy Dwight was the star. Uh, Dwight was the descendant of some of the most eminent Puritan theologians of the past two centuries. Um, and it was this lineage that helped authorized Dwight uh, to turn New England's intellectual class 
uh, to support both nationalism and missionary work, uh, both of which did not fit comfortably with Puritan theology. I'll give you a short excerpt from one of Timothy Dwight's poems. It's his 1775 poem, The Burning of Charleston. Yes, there's a God whose laws are still the same, whose years are endless and whose power is great. He is our God, Jehovah is his name. With him we trust our sore oppressed state. Dwight's most popular poem, written when he was very young, um, it's called Columbia, Columbia. And just one more uh, 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 sample of Dwight's poetry for you. <laughs> I won't inflict it on you long. Columbia, Columbia, to glory arise, the queen of the world and the child of the skies. New bards and new sages, unrivaled, shall soar to fame unextinguished, whose time is no more. Uh, Columbia was a euphemism for the United States. Um, it's not terrible, but it's not very good poetry either. Uh, the most important lines, in a sense, are the last two. Uh, new bards and new sages shall soar to fame unextinguished when time is no more. Uh, who were these new bards and new sages who were going to soar to historic heights? Uh, they were Timothy Dwight and his friends, the Connecticut Wits. Uh, this is also something that doesn't fit worldly fame and power is another thing that doesn't fit too easily with Puritanism, um, and, uh, uh, but it was something that this group uh, uh, not only hungered for, but it's one of the things that makes their writings very interesting, is that they were convinced uh, that <clears throat> they were going to be the Smiths of American culture. Uh, and uh, like a lot of New England Protestants, uh, they were uh, prolific writers and publishers, uh, and they wrote about their imminent role in steering the course of the American-led world empire at great length. They wrote about this, and when one continues to read it, of course it didn't come to pass. There's almost a certain poignancy of the kind of unmerited confidence that one sees in certain uh, uh, types of comedic roles in films. But, but this is all on paper and in poems and treatises. Um, Dwight also wrote um, an epic poem. Actually, several of them wrote epic poems. Uh, and this is just one of the interesting examples of how kind of off they were about what happened to American culture. Uh, if there is a kind of American national poet, if one does come along in the 19th century, it's not until probably Walt Whitman and Whitman's voice is, is, is bawdy and demotic, and, and uh, <clears throat> the Connecticut Wits voice was very different. Uh, his, uh, Dwight's epic poem, The Conquest of Canaan, was meant self-consciously to be to the founding of the United States what Virgil's Aeneid was to the founding of Rome. It typified their literary style, which was neoclassicism, resounding with events and characters of the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, and replete with references to contemporary, meaning 18th century British literature. Um, <clears throat> Dwight also uh, wrote, at, as uh, several of the wits did, but Dwight in particular, about the Americans' identification with, with the, the Jews and the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, they generally preferred the Hebrew scriptures. As many of you know, uh, Jesus was a somewhat secondary figure to the Puritans. They preferred God. Uh, but Dwight also wrote about how the Americans would follow the Hebrews in their trajectory from uh, abused provincials to world historical figures. The conquest of Canaan is one of the great failures in the history of American literature. It is 11 books, nearly 10,000 lines long, uh, and there is probably not a person alive who can quote two of its lines. Uh, the important point about it, however, is that Dwight began writing it in 1771. Again, in 1771, nobody was an American nationalist except this, this group of writers. Uh, their poetry is not great literature. Um, 
One of the things that makes it not great literature uh, is the same quality that gives it historical importance, uh, and that is the extent to which it is absolutely full of social and political commentary. The role of law in society, slavery, maritime commerce, tax policy, legislative agendas, political districting, local controversies, prison policy, uh, and one of their favorite preoccupations, gender roles. Um, I think Greenfield Hill is up here. One of these covers is Deutz's poem, Greenfield Hill. Uh, but it wasn't, I, I, spent, I, I spent a semester on a fellowship doing nothing, very little but reading their poetry. Uh, and it wasn't until reading, it's kind of like studying Churchill's paintings or something, but it wasn't until reading their poetry that I, I came to see that, um, actually in, in, in our discussions in our day about, uh, especially in relation to the Middle East right now, there are these, these questions about what women wear, you know, this isn't uh, by themselves the ends are not, uh, it's not really about whether uh, the hijab or not, uh, but that women's social roles are, are especially powerful shorthand for visions of different kinds of societies. And the wits in their poetry at length focus on women's roles as, as, as a kind of emotionally resonant shorthand for what kind of society America should and should not be. Um, and in fact, <clears throat> one can even say that it's in these poems that American nationality finds its first fully articulated expression. They intended their work to steward America into the 19th century, and they wanted, they pictured uh, the United States as essentially becoming uh, a much larger version of 18th century New England, especially Massachusetts and Connecticut. So that raises the question of what was revolutionary era New England like? It was a distinct society. It was unusual in the New World in that it was settled by families. It was almost the only part of British North America actually settled for religious reasons. Its settlers were not European, much less British but distinctively English and principally from three or four counties in Eastern England. The state exerted a very strong presence in, in social and moral life. In revolutionary, both in both Connecticut and Massachusetts, for example, the state had the right to remove children from their parents if, this, and, uh, if the state judged them to the parents to be improperly educating the children. Massachusetts actually forbid anyone not worth more than 200 pounds, uh, which was a lot of money at the time, from, and this is the actual statute, from, quote, wearing gold or silver or lace or buttons or bone lace above two shillings per yard or silk hoods or silk scarves. As late as 1804, Massachusetts officials had members of their own judiciary uh, arrested for traveling on a Sunday. Uh, Massachusetts also allowed into the 19th century, quote, and again, this is the actual statute, any person or persons to apprehend without a warrant any Jesuit priest or Roman ecclesiastic. In 18th century Connecticut, it was illegal to fly a kite. You were supposed to be focusing your mind on more serious things. Yet, New England elites believed that they had built one of the freest and most virtuous societies in the world. Why? Well, it was one of the most literate societies up to, in human history to that point. 70% of mid-18th century New England men were literate. Uh, at the time, that, that was an exceptionally high figure for the time. In France, the rate was at most 50%. Poverty was rare in colonial New England, in revolutionary era New England. The New England economy was based on, on small-scale uh, farming and maritime commerce. Uh, it simply did not have the large, illiterate, and subordinated laboring class or mass of enslaved laborers 
that one found in Barbados or Peru, or for that matter in Barbados, uh, uh, England or Virginia. Um, and this is one of the things that fascinates me about these people, about these New Englanders. Uh, the New Englanders prized relative social equality, uh, but they were not egalitarians. And this is difficult for uh, Americans of today to wrap their heads around because we think of these two as going together. They spoke openly about society's natural elite and the imperatives of social deference. And these views, especially in post-revolutionary America, uh, made them very easy political targets. Jeffersonians characterized them as aristocrats, as royalists, as monocrats, a kind of 18th century, early 19th century term of abuse, monocrat. I'll show you a cartoon in a moment about that. Um, <clears throat> and something about their own kind of characters is that their involved defenses of their political views often did them more harm than good. Um, their poetry also uh, is, is what, what is also very interesting about it is that it percolates with contempt for rich people. And this is part of what I'm getting at when I'm saying they're, they're uh, hierarchical. Um, they were not egalitarians, they were hierarchical. Uh, but uh, they describe at length how societies that allow too much concentration of wealth uh, have lost their way. And if one reads their poetry and their treatises, one sees again and again and again, <clears throat> the rich evade taxes, skimp on charity, connive for wars, they lack the courage to fight, uh, and the rich uh, lose the ability, in the view of these New Englanders, to enjoy uh, what they saw as the true Christian virtues of life, uh, family, hospitality, neighborliness. Uh, so to them, social hierarchy was inevitable. Uh, and a godly society, the challenge before a godly society was to ma manage and limit social hierarchy. But they were not egalitarians. <clears throat> um, they did not find in the discourse of race uh, a solution to the challenge that slavery posed to American ideals. Their poetry is unrelentingly and graphically anti-racist. This also surprised me. I think perhaps the simplest way to position them into what uh, position them uh, in relation to what the um, United States of America became is to contrast them with the Jeffersonian version of American nationality that prevailed. The Jeffersonian version of American nationality uh, is egalitarian, evangelical, and racist. The New England Federalist vision, um, of which there is no better expression than their poetry, was, in contrast, hierarchical, theological, as opposed to evangelical, and anti-racist. They liked to quote a certain saying. Uh, it's a saying that's often attributed to Plato, but in fact seems to be of uncertain origin. And the saying is, <clears throat> allow me to write the songs of a nation, and you may make its laws. The line implicitly acknowledged the greater uh, political and economic resources of the Middle States, and particularly the South. Uh, the key point, however, is that these New Englanders uh, did not write the songs of a nation, um, and they did not write the national laws. Americans rejected their literature and their culture, uh, and their political defeat was even more dramatic. Political control of the 19th century United States was essentially decided uh, by a competition between Northeastern capitalists and Southern planters for the political support of small farmers, especially on the frontier. Basically, from 1800 to 1860, the small farmers preferred the Southern planters to the uh, Northeastern merchant class. In 1800, Thomas Jefferson won the presidency without winning a single electoral vote from New England. In 1803, uh, the Jefferson administration's Louisiana Purchase more than doubled the size of the United States, uh, and it also uh, greatly weakened the already declining political power of New England in the context of American politics. 
In 1804, when Jefferson ran for re-election, he won every state in the Union this time except for Connecticut. Uh, Timothy Dwight was by then president of, of Yale College, which he made Yale University, uh, and he had also by this time become America's, probably America's leading anti-Jeffersonian spokesman. Uh, and th there's an illustration of, of how uh, a certain kind of change to imagine that a college president could, could be a leading national political spokesperson, but it, so, such it was. Um, <clears throat> when Jefferson's successor, James Madison, uh, another Virginia slave owner, uh, led America into the War of 1812, a war that a war with Britain that basically closes down m most of uh, North Atlantic maritime commerce and severely uh, 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 impairs the New England uh, economy. Uh, these New Englanders responded uh, with the Hartford Convention, which is a dramatic and underappreciated event in American history. Uh, in December of 1814 to January of 1815, 26 leading members of New England society met in Hartford, Connecticut. The meeting became known as the Hartford Convention. Uh, all seven Connecticut delegates, um, Connecticut delegates had been Timothy Dwight's students at Yale. Some were members of the Yale administration. Um, Timothy Dwight's brother, Theodore, was the secretary of the convention. Uh, and Timothy Dwight's protege, Noah Webster, had organized the convention. Now, here is what Thomas Jefferson had to say about the Hartford Convention. It's hard to listen to. I find it hard to listen to root quotes, so I, I put this up here for you. <clears throat> I'll, I'll read it to you, too, but you can, you can read it yourselves as well. So this is... Um, <clears throat> yeah. These reverend leaders of the Hartford nation, it seems then, are now falling together about religion, of which they have not one real principle in their hearts. Like bods, uh, euphemism for prostitutes, like bods, religion becomes to them a refuge from the despair of their loathsome vices. They seek in it only an oblivion of the disgrace with which they have loaded themselves in their political ravings and of their mortification at the ridiculous issue of their Hartford Convention. No event more than this has shown the placid character of our Constitution. Under any other, their treasons would have been punished by the halter. We let them live as laughingstocks for the world and punish them by the torment of eternal contempt. So uh, what did the Hartford Convention do to earn Jefferson's censure? Uh, they demanded a set of changes to the US Constitution upon threat of secession from the US. Uh, now, what these changes actually were are quite interesting. Well, they wanted to remove the three-fifths clause from the United States Constitution. Uh, the three-fifths clause basically gave Southern planters 66 votes for, one every, uh, for every 100 slaves they owned, uh, and in so doing, secured their domination of American electoral politics. The Hartford Convention also demanded uh, a constitutional amendment to limit U.S. presidents to one term. They also asked for a constitutional amendment uh, requiring uh, a president to be from a different state than his predecessor. Uh, all of these demands were aimed to limit the, the uh, power of Southern planters in American politics, particularly the Virginia dynasty. and, and um, <clears throat> None of them had any chance whatsoever of finding effective political support. Uh, James Madison is said to have laughed out loud when he read the demands of the Hartford Convention. Um, so the Hartford Convention sent a representative to Washington, D.C. to present their demands to the public. Uh, the problem was that due to the slowness of early 19th century communications, uh, in between the time they left Hartford and arrived in Washington, D.C., uh, Andrew Jackson's improbable victory in the Battle of New Orleans 
had turned the tide of the war. And so the New Englanders arrived in Washington uh, to denounce uh, in the strongest possible terms a war that their country had basically just won. Uh, in the annals of political history, this remains a particularly effective recipe for political suicide. Uh, and it, it fully discredited the New England Federalists in American party politics. Um, <clears throat> in response to this defeat, not just of their platform or of their party, but uh, of their way of life, uh, New England Protestants, in effect, took their show on the road. Uh, they began reaching out to their British cousins who had been loyalists during the Revolutionary War, uh, and the New Englanders, in a sense, uh, reintegrated themselves into the British Empire uh, and their version of Am American nationality uh, as a reformed Protestant missionary movement. Uh, and this is one of the important and interesting characteristics of the American missionary movement is that it was from the beginning an Anglo-American reform Protestant movement. This is in no way uh, representative of uh, some general picture of American religion. Um, not only, and this I haven't talked about today, but uh, not only had the New Englanders kind of lost the battle for political control of the United States, uh, that was uh, uh, an insult to them. Um, the injury came uh, with the invention of, of popular American Protestantism, Methodism, Baptism, the Disciples of Christ, the Mormons. Uh, uh, so uh, they had been really the first American nationalists uh, and the first people to call for an independent United States. But both American politics and American religion got away from them very quickly. Um, in the context of American political history, uh, the American missions movement was basically the first form of American nationality gone into exile already by 1815. Um, <clears throat> despite their pioneering role in creating the United States, uh, they, American, uh, uh, Americans rejected them. Uh, American religion went in a very different direction. American political democracy wasn't interested in their leadership. Uh, and they went abroad, looking for new communities through which to regenerate the world. By 1840, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, just one of, these or one of their missionary organizations, su was supporting missionary endeavors. And this easily made it the, the most uh, the largest American international organization at the time. By 1840, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions was supporting missionary endeavors in India, Sri Lanka, China, Burma, Singapore, Thailand, the Sandwich Islands, Athens, Beirut, Persia, Cyprus, Syria, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and among the Zulus in Southern Africa. Uh, and here I have a... This is the Jeffersonian's uh, version of the Hartford Convention. Um, basically, it's a Jeffersonian. Charles Colton was a Jeffersonian cartoonist, and this is one of his cartoons, uh, castigating and mocking the New Englanders. Uh, the basic uh, charge is that they were uh, wanted to return to the British Empire. They were about to jump back into the arms of, of King George. Um, <clears throat> he has uh, uh, <clears throat> Colton has depicted them as uh, goading each other over their fasting and their prayers as to who will, through these means, find enough courage to leave the United States and, and return to the king. Uh, Timothy Pickering comes in for a particular century. He's dressed in his uh, the all black was a kind of jibe at the pure. Uh, a stereotype of Puritan dress that wasn't even a very accurate, wasn't a, it was a stereotype, it wasn't accurate. Um, but Pickering is depicted as a kneeling, again, fearful figure. Um, and 
The reason that the Jeffersonians particularly hated Timothy Pickering goes back to this kind of politics of, of racism. Uh, Pickering had been Secretary of War in the Washington administration, and Jefferson was Secretary of State. Uh, and over Je Jefferson's determined opposition, Timothy Pickering outmaneuvered Jefferson within the politics of the cabinet in order to provide uh, material support to uh, Toussaint Louverture and the Haitians during the Haitian Revolution. Uh, the Haitians, after all, had cited the American example as an inspiration, uh, and that was good enough for Timothy Pickering. Uh, so American warships actually did uh, support the Haitian Revolution uh, under the charge of the at time Secretary of War Timothy Pickering. Um, <clears throat> finally, it may also be worth thinking about the origins of the Anglo-American missionary movement um, in terms of uh, the continuing claims by uh, some, by members of contemporary society that America was founded as a Christian country. It was not, but imagine for a moment these, that those pioneering revolutionary era patriots and Christians uh, had in fact gotten what they wanted, had they in fact gotten to run the United States of America. Um, their Christian America would have been the theological and hierarchical. Uh, it would not have been evangelical. It would not have been egalitarian. It would have been statist with laws regulating many aspects of private and moral life. It would not have had slaves. It would have held in very high regard education and teachers, uh, in particular science and literature and foreign languages. In government, in culture, in geography and population, and perhaps especially in religion, it would in fact look very different from the country uh, that those who currently claim America is a Christian nation would want to have. Thank you.